Well, thank you so much. Um, when I was first invited to come and speak, I didn't know why, uh, but now I'm here. So let me tell you a story about myself. So like you had, I was born in Somalia, which is at the Eastern Horn of Africa. Um, you see, that's not where I am today, unfortunately, and I've never been since birth. Um, shortly after, uh, in the late 1980s, there was a civil war that broke out in my hometown, which displaced millions of people, including my own family. You see, my, f my father was a teacher and my mom was a trader. And one day while she was away on a business trip, militia men came to our house and my father decided we need to run for civity. So we ended up leaving and joining the rest of the folks that are running away. And in, a, in the span of a moment, we ended up just being at the border of Kenya, seeking asylum and looking for registration and becoming refugees ourselves, leaving everything we owned and every dream my parents had. Shortly, we were registered and then bumped into a lorry by the UN and other agencies, and we ended up in a camp called Dadaab. Dadaab originally was set up as a temporary site to house refugees until there was settlement that is happening within Somalia. But unfortunately, 25 plus years to date, Dadaab is still open. It has earned the, large, uh, the title of being the largest refugee camp in the world. Operationally, Dadaab is run by a number of NGOs, including the UN. They provide services ranging from water and sanitation, logistics, and education. It is the education sector that made the most impact on me and many millions of refugees who came through uh, Dadaab. You see, in 1994, when I first went to school, I, I was excited about the school itself, but I was most excited about getting a free pencil and a paper <laughs> to write on. And we ended up going to school under a tree because there's not enough structures to house all the students. Any person who could read or write Arabic or Somali, which is the native language we spoke, was hired to be a teacher. So there was absolutely no qualification required. Eventually, we found a sense and a purpose as to why we stayed in the camps. We had semi-permanent structures built. Uh, we adopted the KN system of education, which was a model of the British system, which is eight years of primary education, four years of secondary, and four years of uh, high school, four years of, sec of university. But then in the camps, you only had to go up to secondary. Other than that, there was the end. So when I graduated in 2012, uh, 20, 2005 from high school, I had nothing to do. So I applied for scholarships, and I was lucky to get sponsored by the World University Services of Canada, which is a partnership between Canadian local universities and the, Canadi and the Canadian government to sponsor would-be refugee students who can get admission from any university. So I was lucky to get admission from UBC, and I arrived in 2007 by myself, leaving behind all my family, with just $20 given to me by my sponsors to buy snacks if I became hungry throughout the journey. But luckily enough, I made it, and in 2012, I graduated from UBC, but instead of attending my convocation, being the ever adventurous, I went back to the DAP. Because you see, that was a big deal for my parents too. It wasn't just for me. So I remember as part of our journey while we were coming here, we were, we were with a CBC documentary team that were fascinated by our story, and then the producer ended up writing a, a book about us. While born in Somalia, raised in Kenya all my life, I never held a citizenship other than that of Canada. So I was a citizen of nowhere throughout this journey. Um, Dadaab is not an easy place to access, but I made it. I celebrated with my parents on my convocation day. I remember I was sitting with my, my, my mom and my dad and telling them stories about my life in Canada over the last five years that I was over there. I ended up being back into my old house where all, I had all my childhood memories with absolutely no running water, no electricity, but I felt most at home. The housing structure since has been a little bit much more renovated, thanks to some money that I've been sending while I was a student. Um, had only a, a mattress and a mosquito net inside, which to me felt luxurious compared to my Thunderbird residence at UBC, which I just moved out uh, as a result of my graduation. <laughs> so I was, uh, I will tell, uh, daytime, I'll tell stories to my sister about life in Canada and what that meant for me. And, but in the mornings, I would also wake up, go to the kitchen, split firewood with my sister, and cook. For the first time, I was able to cook because traditionally in my culture, men don't cook and don't even go to the kitchen. But here I was making breakfast with my sister, and I was actually pretty darn good at cooking. <laughs> um, she, was, she was impressed. But after that journey, I made a decision upon return to Canada that I'll do something different, that I will pursue to help other refugees and newcomers that are coming to Canada use my expertise and my living experiences to make life a little bit better. So I ended up working with refugees that are coming to Canada with NGOs that are providing services to them. You see, when I was shocked, I realized, despite all the story I told you, that I was extremely privileged. Because the journey of my parents, we do not lose any loved ones. Um, I came to this country speaking English, seeking education from a university, 
And these are big folks that I was working with that didn't speak English, had low literacy levels, just lost loved ones. So I worked closely worked with the diversity offices at Fraser Health to design a program and an education around how to provide care to refugees. Eventually, and as I stand in front of you today, I lead that department that I was advocating for a while back. You see, in healthcare, in general, we work with and serve people who are extremely diverse and who are different from us. This diversity can take many forms. We are ethnically diverse, we're culturally diverse, we're religiously diverse, and so on. But the way I like to see diversity is any way you and I can be significantly be different from one another, and how does that affect how we provide care and how we receive care from one another? See, if we need to value diversity, um, and the quality, the, the, that, the value of diversity also comes, shows up how responsive is our healthcare t system to differences in beliefs, differences in practices, and differences in, um, in our value system in general. See, I like to see us as, as a team that collaboratively needs to work together and provide services that are culturally and linguistically appropriate. Evidence has shown time and again, I think, um, that if we do not provide care that takes, uh, provide care that takes into account the cultural and linguistic barriers, then we are compromising the care we're giving. Unlike other developed countries, including our neighbors to the south, language services is not a right in, 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 in Canada. Health authorities have done a little bit to provide that services, but we need to do more. My hope at the end of the day is that our care system moves uh, to a space where we all respect diversity in the daily interactions, care planning, and system design. Thank you.